video nasty! other than using the restroom and sleeping. And it's uh, uh, quite an experience. I hope y'all have had some enjoyment. Hi, my name is Matt Gleason, and uh, our, our guests, of course, the esteemed Robert Williams. Director of Mocha Jeffrey Dyke, Meg Linton, the Director of Galleries and Exhibitions at Otis College of Art and Design, and an eminent artist in his own right, Jim Shaw. <laughs> I wanted to start with the, with the show Artists Museum, which includes works by Robert Williams. Uh, Mr. Dyke, did you uh, yourself select Robert? How did Robert make the cut finally after all these years? <laughs> <laughs> Coming from New York City, I have a different perspective on Los Angeles. And one of the artists, Jimmy here, one of the artists who is often talked about by New York artists for years is Robert Williams. And I was very interested that it's not just the art school artists who talk about Robert. It's Debbie Harry, Chris Stein. It's the impact is gone throughout advanced contemporary visual culture. And so it was obvious that we were going to do an exhibition that included artists who had a crucial impact on Los Angeles art during the 30-year history of MOCA. Robert Williams had to be central to the dialogue. Do you see this uh, without uh, without locking you into making a bet? Do you see the evolution of art heading, heading in some direction that uh, perhaps uh, Early Juxtapose magazine and the art of Robert Williams might have indicated already for us. With, with the readership of Juxtapose, it's the people speaking. It's uh, the this is an interesting phenomenon where the audience is in certain ways moved ahead of some of the established magazines and some of the museum curators in embracing Robert's work, uh, the museum is in a way catching up with where the audience already is. Robert, you've been on the, I guess, both sides of the coin now. You've been outside and now obviously feeded at the institution inside. Uh, which is better? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Jeffrey realizes this, but I was 86th out of MOCA in 92 at the Helter Skelter show, so he is unknowingly, inadvertently slipped me back in. <laughs> uh, I hope this doesn't come down on him, but uh, I'm going my way back into the walls of MOCA. Uh, well, it's, to answer your question, it, it seems like the, the, the outside has become the inside now. Uh, there's, you can see art really, really changing in the last 10 years, and it's especially the last five years. And uh, uh, I, I talk to people like Ed Shea and other blue chip artists, and uh, they're, they're comfortable with the change. It's not like a, 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 an anti-modernist movement. It's a, it's a situation where 
there is no bad art. It's, uh, all art is either good or it doesn't interest you. And bad art is something that falls off the wall and breaks your leg. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, originally, the, 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 I was very anti-formal art when I was coming through art school because of the uh, prohibitions on representational art that uh, mellowed and things have changed very slowly. And if you'll notice in the movie industry, a vast majority of the movies now is uh, either inspired or related to comic books, and so you, the, the circle's coming around. That will answer your question. Did, did you agree with Did you agree with the characterization of the uh, comics of, in, in the movie from Tony Shafazi as a as a purely American art form as a, as as being indicative of the breakaway historically from Europe? Well, we can argue that we can go back to the uh, tapestries and manuscripts and call those comic books if you want. So, uh, you know, but I think Tony's basically right. Uh, it, Comics are a very lowbrow uh, cultural form. Not, not only Tony Shafrazi, but uh, Jeffrey here are very perceptive about comics. And uh, when, when I first met Jeffrey a little over a year ago in New York, he blurted out that he was a big reader early on of Zap Comics. And Zap Comics was a very subversive comic book. So uh, the poison is, uh, you know, infiltrated early in a lot of people. <laughs> Meg, you're, you're, you're going to have to be the, uh, the, the foil relative to the criticism of the film uh, as far as Robert's depictions with women. Has there been a, a bit of an evolution relative to the perceptions? Well, today, looking at those images of women, you see them as really, I see them anyway, as very empowered women. Um, these are women who could be having their own reality show, making lots of money off of their own image instead of someone else making you know, so I think the, the timing in watching this work um, age and how society has changed and grown that way, I think is really interesting in how women have become more empowered in the art world and in the professional world. Is it, I, I guess when we're looking at uh, an overview of your career, Robert, we are seeing a sort of a historical time period to, especially when the film allots us all the perspective. I mean, you you have the vantage point of, of saying these, these things happen in real time historically, but you also get the sort of um, the added bonus that we can look at your art and that you maybe saw it coming. Do you like the uh, position of being the, uh, the foreteller of the future? Uh, I, I think you're reading too much into this. I think this is a virtual office here and it really isn't there. Uh, um, let me portray this for you, though. Um, I came out here in 63, and I came out here as a young fella that had ideas of really adventurous art with uh, comic book influence and pulp magazine cover influence and um, one sheet movie poster influence and a, a, a lot of excitement and enthusiasm and that was dull real quick when I come to school in Los Angeles discovered that I was in the world of abstract expressionism and you to make no suggestion of perspective and uh, you were to, to, to spend more than two days on a painting meant you were retarded. <laughs> um, so this really really hurt me but Understanding that I was young and I was in a world that I was looking for information, I took it for granted that I was the dumbass and I had better learn what the, the art regulations were and to fit in. So I tried to adjust myself to abstract expressionism. Now, when abstract expressionism settled in in the late 50s and early 60s, it was an absolute. It was absolute and there was no challenging it. It was a freedom, it was a new world, it was a new virtue. The, the, the theory was it, was, it was honesty. Abstract expressionism was honesty. If you paint it, paint like you've got paint on the canvas. If you carved something, you sculpted something, sculpt it rough, because that's the nature of wood, that's the nature of steel, that's the nature of stone. You had to do everything with an emotional look to it, to be true to the media. You had to be true to the media or you were a fake. If you, uh, a painting that suggested three dimensions 
was a cheap trick for people with limited mentalities from the past. So I had an enormous amount of fellow student friends, and they referred to me as the illustrator. I had friends from Otis, Chenard's, on UCLA, and all of them were painting quick and sloppy, and they did not hundreds, thousands of goddamn paintings. Where are they now? Where are these great pieces of work now? <laughs> And I was just ridiculed all the time, and so I just got kind of shoved out of it, you know, and uh, my saving grace was Hot Rods and Underground Comics, and my story. Uh, Mr. Dice, you've been, you've been on the commercial side of things and now the institutional side of things. Have you seen a, a, a sea change, so to speak, in, uh, I'm going to say, the of taste? Uh, and maybe now with the, the, the higher levels of museum trustees and members here, as far as their open-mindedness to a, an art form that was once considered low, and uh, you know, the, I mean, I can remember a show at MoCA that came from uh, New York that was the high and low, and Zap comics were in the vitrines because they weren't art, and the high art was on the wall, and everything that was low art, like comics and, and other paraphernalia, was in, it was in it, like sort of like so they couldn't share the same oxygen with the art. Uh, on the wall is the real art. Uh, but have you noticed relative to uh, the tastemakers and, and, and you know, frankly, the gasoline that runs the art world, the money as far as the buyers uh, headed this way? Well, for first, there continues to be a contest between the heritage of abstract expressionism, conceptual art, and quality lowbrow art that Robert represents. So it continues back to that wonderful convergence of high art and popular American culture, where you mix it together and create a truly American vision, which which people relate to, which which excites people. It's art that speaks to people. And so to answer specifically, yes, the in the commercial side. Uh, there is a lot of interest, and that is reflected also in the museum audience. Uh, you know, Jim, you're, you're, you're pretty well known for your thrift store painting collection, and uh, uh, it's generally considered, a, instead of on the high-low caliber, maybe the good-bad. Um, what, what can we discover, and, and, and when I say we, I think the people who enjoy this sort of um, this coming of age of lowbrow art. What what is it about bad art that's that's out there for people to to really draw from, especially the artists to draw from? You mean thrift store paintings? Yes. Or, uh, prefer not to use the term bad art. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one thing is you don't you don't really know why the person did the artwork you're seeing. It's got no history, so it allows you to project onto it a lot. All right, Robert, I want you to have the last word. <laughs> well, now in history, in my observation, and I've, I've been painting for a little over 50 years, there is more opportunity now for young people in the arts than there ever has been in history. And the reason for that is because there are so many different avenues now that you can take off in graphically. You know, uh, finally, I think the door has been open on... Uh, uh, representation art, and there, there, there's been really not that big a loss to uh, conceptualism and minimalism and abstract expressionism. I think they're going to keep going for a long, long time. It's just a wonderfully free time, but it's uh, like I would say to any young person, uh, I would never, uh, I would never try to talk a young person into being an artist. You have to find that on your own because there is such a large failure rate in being an artist. It's almost as bad as trying to be a poet. <laughs> you get a grasp of that. If you understand that, then you can go beyond. You can attempt it. But you have to have the rational understanding that uh, you're really uh, taking a big chance. And I, I want to thank all of you for coming. Thank you. <laughs>